So I want to talk a little bit about kind of, because um, this seems like just a random series of projects where it's like, well, what is happening? Has he just been running around kind of just without any real plan and just doing stuff? Um, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but the way that we've been making it happen, um, having a website helps <coughs> to do some of this stuff. You know, the web is such a great way of democratizing information. The only problem with the public sector is that more often than not, public sector websites are not very good at handling this sort of information. Um, so one of the things that we did earlier in the year was we launched a website <coughs> dedicated to the visual presentation of data, visual.ons.gov.uk. Um, it's got a variety of the kinds of content that we've been looking at there with a few caveats. So there's a lot of interactives, some infographics, I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Um, some short analysis pieces, but what I thought I'd show you is analysis pieces that work in a certain way. Um, this is, uh, there was a lot to talk in, in Europe, a lot of celebrations around Victory in Europe Day recently, and so we produced an article for Visual that was kind of how did the war change the UK? Um, and we used a lot of annotated graphs to do that. Um, and what I would say is, you know, forget a lot of the bells and whistles that we've seen of animation and interactivity. The single best improvement to most data graphics that you can make is to write on them. You know, um, if, you, if you think about who you are presenting to and what we talked about earlier in terms of context biases and what people may or may not know in advance of looking at it, writing clear messages on the chart really helps guide people into what to look at and how to read it. You can't rely on just a pure abstract interpretation of the geometry doing everything for you. Okay, so a lot, and so that's the first rule. The second rule is with a lot of these items, start with the chart. A lot of these items start virtually from the off with the image. World War II had a big impact on marriages. Here it is. Rather than, oh, I better do all my explanatory blurb, little note on methodology, caveats, assumptions, methods, oh, then I'll put in the graph. Um, start with the chart, back it up with text, keep the visual frame going, use the visuals to drive the narrative. You'll end up writing a lot less text. Okay, that's really, really important. One of the problems that we've had to deal with recently is everyone saying, yeah, okay, you and your smart annotations, but one of the constraints we've got on the web these days, it's not constraints, it's just the design criteria, is more and more people are looking at this sort of stuff on mobiles and tablets, so how does that factor into the mix? Um, so we've had to spend a little bit of time working to make sure that as this window closes, we better be prepared to do something with that annotation. And can you just see it swaps over, so when the screen gets smaller, don't pretend you can cram same amount of information into the space. Um, you know, and this sort of stuff's relatively easy to do now because the tools to do it are becoming very democratized. But that really helps because then you're aware that no matter regardless of where people are seeing what they're looking at it on, that it will work. Okay. Um, so Visual ONS is a website that we designed specifically to host that kind of content, and that's really helped. But the good, I mean, the good news is it's just a little WordPress website. It's probably one of the smallest government websites ever built. It's a blog that we can put some images on. It's a great place to start. Um, the way that we've worked with it at uh, the UK Statistics Office is to recognize that the bedrock of all of this is this thing here. Um, now I looked at the attendance list today, and I'm guessing that a lot of you work like in analytical roles and in analytical organizations or you know, similar sorts of things. Um, <coughs> it's really funny, not many organizations have power in those areas. And so um, for us, that is the bedrock of everything else we do. But what we've realized is it's useless having that on its own. Um, fuse it with digital design, which is becoming increasingly important. And then importantly, some editorial principles in place as well. And then you've got a fairly powerful cocktail thing. 
Um, in fact, digital design and editorial principles are things that other organizations usually are better than mine at. I'm thinking particularly the media will probably be stronger in those areas than mine would. But that statistical rigor is the bit that most organizations, or a lot of organizations, are lighter on. And so that's why the, the cocktail is most um, important. Um, the editorial principles is important. I thought when I said, write on the graph, I might get a few people say, bloody hell, uh, I'm supposed to say something about it, you know? Uh, well, isn't it graffiti to write on a graph? Doesn't it make it biased to write on a graph? Um, no, it doesn't. The decision to make a graph is an editorial decision, and it flows that you're then in charge of the design of it which should rest heavily on the editorial principles. Why am I showing it and what am I trying to show? What is the relevance of it? Um, so the editorial principles are really important. Your job as an analyst is not just to present some numbers. So this is just a little bit of thinking under the hood on what we've been doing with content and how we've been trying to map out content onto different kind of user needs. We've done some work as an office of trying to identify the different range of people that we are trying to serve. And we've distilled it down in the best principles of overgeneralizing things um, to this three here. They're kind of archetypal users of our data. The expert analysts are kind of, if you like, the traditional users of official statistics. Um, and progressively as you go left to right, you can probably assume lowering statistical literacy as you go across, but also from my organization's perspective, we've probably also got less experience in supporting those kinds of users as we move less to right. As an organization, it will vary wherever you are. Um, in our organization, I think we can distill what we do with data into three principal content layers. The core data, the numbers, our chance to comment on numbers when we first publish them, and then everything else that we would do, I think we could probably say, is about insight. If you're saying something that does not fall into the insight layer, then you probably shouldn't be saying it. You know, it's like that should be one of your editorial principles. But what we've ended up doing is kind of saying, well, that's quite a useful framework for coming up with a nice game of noughts and crosses, where we can kind of say, actually, not all users want all sorts of things. Our kind of general audience really aren't desperately looking for the latest CSV downloads and retail price index, you know. Um, but some users are. From a visualization perspective, you might be thinking, well, there's no visualization in that core data layer. And I'd say you were wrong, because I think dashboards are part of the data layer. They're not narrative. They are a way of getting to numbers quickly. So they're part of the data layer. They belong in a different space. Um, We've got different words for the things that we call first release commentary, but they're usually the dull, long PDF files that people tend to ignore. The insight products for me is where we get really interesting because the insight products are the ones where there are a lot of digital opportunities to do stuff, and that they will vary depending on the user. In particular, this kind of inquiring citizen is particularly interested in all of this data going back to the visual, personal, social. How does it relate to me? and what I'm hearing about in the news. Why should I even bother engaging with it? Um, and actually, that small little square there is what visual.ons is supposed to be about. It's only doing a very small part of our job for us. It's this little bit here. It's this little tiny little bit here. So I'll come talk about that, but not everything is for everyone. Um, and then kind of finally, <laughs> we talked about memorability earlier. And um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is quite funny. A researcher in my team produced this map. A guy called Rob, my team produced this map. Rob's good with maps, and he instantly knew this was pretty crap. <laughs> Why is this a crap map? Because uh, the western part of Cumbria is a low population and a lot of sheep farms. This is this local domain knowledge. So it's a deviation map of earnings. So the red areas are where the earnings are higher than the average, and the blue areas are as lower than the average. And of course, the biggest area of red on the map is this area up here in uh, Cumbria. 
And the reason for that is fairly simple, is that there's a nuclear processing plant there. And I always kind of hedge my bets on this, it's either high risk or high skill. But one of the combination of things is delivering higher wages. Um, but it's utterly unrepresentative of the actual distribution of earnings in the country because there's a generally an inverse relationship between the physical size of the area and the human activity in that area. So in the blue areas, you would think they are densely populated, but that's our rural areas, full of sheep and farms that are tiny compared to New Zealand farms, but you, you know, you get the impression. And so Rob said, how about this? This kind of map, which is called a cartograph, which people might see. He said, what we've done is, if we scale the areas according to the number of jobs in the area, we get a very, very different view of the distribution of earnings in the country. Okay? And we realized, actually, that that's great, Rob, really good work, but there's a bit of a problem here. What might be the problem? People can't find where they are. People can't there. bloody find anything. You know, like, <laughs> if that was actually expressed physically, people would be getting pretty uncomfortable. Um, and so we realised actually, again, these tools, the animations, the transitions, they play a part. They play a part in allowing us to see where is the transformation happening? How is the transformation happening? Um, and actually, on the final version of the graphic, we actually had both the transformed view and the original view next to each other linked to interactivity. So you could interact with the normal view and see it on the transform view and vice versa, it's like two-way brushing. What was unusual with this one though is that the, the impact took us beyond um, the normal kind of ripples. And his MPs worry about how their proposed pay rise plays in their constituencies. New figures show that average earnings for everyone else rose by less than the rate of inflation. Well, I'll skip past this bit. Actually, I'll stop there. I'll stop right Sorry, there. Uh, Hold that bit there, Pfizer. Let's just stop. There we go. Right. We're a statistics office. You know I said that dull PDF file that we produced? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Prime time TV. And at that point, I know, in homes of statistical workers across the country, there would have been frenzied celebration. <laughs> it's there. Who says digital doesn't work in PDF? Right? But we got it even better because uh, this piece went through the earnings release and then when it finished, um, there's the box pop again. Um, when, it, when it finished, I don't know if you can hear the sound. Though. The southeast of England, where pay over the past year has been flat, declining hugely in real terms, whereas it's been going up rather strongly and effectively in Wales and some of the northern English regions. But the bigger picture is, of course, growth jobs and wages to begin with higher in the southeast. And today's data can help us redraw the map of Britain for jobs and wages rather than geography determining the size of local authorities. It looks rather lopsided. By that time I was on the phone before. So <laughs> <laughs> it was like, wow, you know, um, if we hadn't have produced that particular memorable image, the TV report would have been different that evening, and we know that's primetime channel four, one and a half million people viewing that, you know, a lot of them very informed and inquiring citizens, um, and they go away with a slightly different impression of that release, and we were really pleased. It got even better than that, actually, because The Guardian decided to uh, to take it, we, good links for The Guardian, syndication of content's very important for us, and they did a really nice job of, of kind of hosting it. Now, at the same time, as this was all going on, Actually, how much of you were aware of the referendum in Scotland? Yes. Yeah. And when we decided to publish this map, it was just a teensy bit of it, slightly worried. The Scots might not like what was going on here. Because on the transformed map, it's not looking good for Scotland. And my fears were a little bit confirmed that Scottish TV decided only to take the untransformed <laughs> of the map. But curiously, what happened was actually, on the transformed view, both the yes and the no vote championed that map. Because the yes vote said, vote for independence because look how London-centric the economy is. And the no vote said what? Share resources. Well, like, in the UK. without it, we'd be irrelevant. You know, tiny and irrelevant. So there's this lovely sense, again, of people's preconceptions and also preconceived ideas mapping onto what they're seeing. Uh, all of that was completely put to rest by the Huffington Post deciding <laughs> to 
feature the map alongside Miley Cyrus. Twerking. <laughs> and in doing so, they missed possibly the best headline of the year. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are wasted on yeah. this. <laughs> we are really frustrated kind of sub editors. Um, and in fact, the headline that they did come up with was Government Produces Interactive Map. <laughs> <laughs> Chimpanzee writes novel on typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> time, and it was bound to happen. Uh, oh, I animated. Uh, any of that happen? So, um, so it was really quite amusing to see that happen. But again, it's like you know the data then are out there and being talked about. And, and it, um, in terms of the memorability, the transform map is great because on social media, some people saying things like, oh, you know, it looks a bit like a strangled chicken. <laughs> and I kind of like the idea that people have this link, earnings, strangled chicken. Uh, right, and they make a note of it, and then they come back to it, and what, what were they thinking? Some people actually had much ruder descriptions of it, but hey, if it makes it memorable, I'm not going to complain. Um, 